Friends, you are at the Wild at Heart podcast. And yes, the new music bed is an invitation to a new way. We realize that what folks need in this hour are experiential practices of a pace and a cadence and a rhythm to life that heal your union with Christ. And so I love I love the old music. It's been around for a while, but it's kind of stimulating, exciting, and the idea is you are about to be entertained. We, we don't want to entertain you. We don't want to primarily give you information. We want to use this podcast time together to bring you into the experience of Jesus. So let's take a moment now to pause. Let's breathe. Take a few deep breaths, everybody, as you begin to release everything. You'd be driving in your car. You could be at the gym. That's okay. Just settle in to the experience. Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. Everything, Lord, everyone from my world, my family, my kids, the people in that meeting today, I give everyone and everything to you, God. I release it all. Just take a moment to release, friends. And we pray, Jesus, Jesus, restore our union, repair and renew, heal, cleanse our union, Lord. I need you. I need attachment. I need oneness, God. I need salvation, which is to be permeated by Jesus. This is our invitation, Lord, today. In your name we pray. Okay, gang, welcome back to the September 26th week podcast here at Wild at Heart, the fourth installment in our series on healing rhythms, healing rhythms, sacred habits, our dailies, our practices, and welcoming back Blaine. And asking you, Blaine, take us back to that Margaret Gunther quote that you brought us in the very first week. I want to build off that. Yeah. It's such a helpful quote. It's because she's introducing her book, right? Right. Margaret practices. Gunther has a book on practices. Yeah. Well, she's a spiritual director, and she observes this that a good rule can set us free to be our true and best selves. It is a working document, a kind of spiritual budget, not carved in stone, but subject to regular review and revision. It should support us, but never constrict us. Okay. I really love the flexibility of that because, again, we're not trying to make a new law here. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. My way. Come and learn my way. It will set you free. She's inviting us into practices that support us. And yeah, Benedict did say, yeah, in the beginning, it does feel narrow. It does feel restrictive. And I'm going to add this because this wasn't Benedict. Yeah, you lost your television show in the evening. Yep, that feels like loss. But you are exchanging it for a walk. You're exchanging it for beautiful music. It, initially, it feels like loss, but it's an exchange for life because over time, narcos or fear the walking dead or whatever, you know, the crazy stuff people watch, exchanging that for a habit in the evening that heals your soul is a really kind thing to do. <laughs> yes. And 
it makes you the kind of person that you probably want to be. N.T. Wright has a really great line about the rule of life of the Old Testament, which is called the law. And he says, in the book of Exodus, Yahweh has two problems. He has to get Israel out of slavery easy. He has to get the slavery out of Israel hard. And we just go, this is actually about getting the slavery to the world and its manipulation of us out of our bodies. And let me just give you the simplest example as we talk about moving towards this. As part of my rule, I dress very simply. It's just something that in my life with God and my personality type, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I was— So you literally, like— Gave away most of your wardrobe. Yeah, exactly. In order to limit the number of choices you were faced with every day. Precisely. There's the simplicity. I don't have to wonder on any day what I'm going to wear. It's the same (laughs) thing. And I had to go to REI recently. I was picking up some boots for my wife. And that is a store that is perfectly designed for my tastes. I want— everything in it. I like every ultralight jacket, every pair of pants, all running shirts, new merino base layers. The new tent. The new tent. Oh, I love it. And it it all is brilliantly designed. And I a lot of that stuff is great. I'm really grateful to have a backpacking tent. But go in REI, and I'm also aware of my, personally, of this allure of do this, live like this, go outdoors wearing this shirt, And you'll get to be in the kind of life you want to live that's really good. And I would ordinarily experience REI as like a punishment where I would just feel the scarcity of my budget and the limitations of God. And I don't have money for any of this. All I have is old crappy gear with duct tape on the shoulders of all my outdoor jackets. And I would experience it. Uh, in such just a punishing negative way. And I was in there the other day and I almost laughed because I looked around and I just went, I have chosen to say no to all of this. And I feel so free in here. I can just walk through and go, no, I just... I just don't do this. I love hiking. I wear the same shirt hiking that I wear doing chores on my homestead yes. and coming into work. And yeah. that's a decision I made to make more space in my mind for God. Yeah, which is what the monasteries made you do when you arrived. You, <laughs> you, you got a few articles of clothing so that all the issues of fashion and culture and comparison could just go away. Can we just set all that aside? Because it's not helpful. So And it's limiting the number of choices. So you talked about it feeling like loss. And in the evening, you're not going to watch the Rings of Power, you know, Lord of the Rings new TV show anymore. But you don't know is how good it will feel. They have, Dad, they have identified a kind of anxiety. It has a name, and it, it might literally be media anxiety. But it's the people wake up knowing that they are behind on the amount of media that they're expected to consume. And so they're going to go into work, and someone's going to ask them, <laughs> have you watched The Rings of Power? And they're going to say, I I haven't even caught up on the Star Wars TV shows, and a new one is about to come out, and that stress. And when you begin to live freely into a rule, you just say no to some of those things, and you don't have to make that choice anymore. You'll like it, everyone. You'll like not being a slave. Okay. Speaking of yoke, speaking of the Old Testament, was listening to the Bible Project guys, and we'd like to give them a shout out because if you don't have a good Bible podcast that you listen to, try that one. Tim Mackey, John Collins out of Portland, great stuff. Tim, John, if you ever want to hang out sometime, I'm <laughs> down. Just, hey, guys. Just tossing that out there. Yeah. Want to come get a burrito? Um, they were doing some reflections on Sabbath and rest. And they were getting to Jesus's invitation to take up his easy yoke. And they were putting that in context of when he says that, 
he's been in recent conflicts about how to live the Sabbath. Okay. And then they quote some research by the Italian scholar Bacciocci and his essay on Matthew 11, Rest and Sabbath. And he's inviting people to rest, Jesus is. And the phrase coming under a yoke or the yoke of a rabbi, this is a, a phrase in Jewish culture, Bacciocci reports, that the metaphor of the yoke was commonly used to express subordination and loyalty to God, especially through obedience to the Torah. So Jeremiah speaks of the leaders of Israel who knew the Torah of their God it was supposed to be the way of life, but had broken the yoke and burst off his bonds. And then in the Mishnah, Rabbi Nikunya, son of Hanukkah, said, anyone who accepts upon himself the yoke of Torah removes from himself the yoke of the way of the world. But the one who casts off the yoke of Torah accepts upon himself the yoke of the way of the world. And what you were just describing about media, anxiety, and all the other things that the world does to your soul, you are yoked, folks, to something. Yes, and but to something that does not love you, that does not have your best interests at heart. The world likes it when you are easy to manipulate. The world loves control. Okay, so our, the REI example was too close to me. I buy stuff to feel better. I'm very aware of it. I'm, I'm fully conscious of it. It, ha it almost happened again this morning. I resisted. But the simple, the simple choice to say, oh, I'm needing comfort right now, instead of getting online and letting Google feed to me all those, you know, ads that its analytics have figured out through my buying patterns they know are just right in the bullseye of my desires. Instead of that, I literally just say, God, I, I need your comfort right now. I, I don't need to buy something. I don't want to go to the world and its way. Yes. I, I need your comfort. And it's it's so simple. Right. And 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 can I say you know, as someone who's tried some of these things you've recommended, they don't work immediately. They do over time. Yes. Uh, Robert Mulholland, who I mentioned before, whose book, Invitation to a Journey, is just so helpful on this stuff, uh, has this line. And he goes, our culture trains us in this manner. Do the right thing. Put the money in the slot. Push the right button and get the product you want at the bottom. Right? That's how the world yeah. works. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it, it, it's ineffective. It does not make us happier over time. But then the problem is, he says, we have a tendency to do the same thing with God. We adopt some new spiritual practice or technique. We find a new coin and a new slot to put it in. We put it in and push a new button, but nothing seems to happen. We start kicking and beating on God. Why don't you do something? We discard the technique and find another coin and another machine. What I'm saying is, as we put off the yoke of the world, we're also putting off its way, acknowledging that it doesn't work, and just asking, like, what is the yoke that leads to life yes. over time? Yes, over time. Not insisting that if you say, God, would you comfort me? you will feel exactly as good as if you just ate an ice cream cone yeah. right what in that moment. Because you won't, but eventually you will. You seriously will. You will. You will. So uh, because of what you just said, we need to tread into some fragile territory for a moment. Where this podcast is headed is to get to some, some more really simple examples on practices you can adopt. Um, you can exchange <laughs> your current rule for a healthier rule, a healthier rhythm, a healthier way. But before we do that, I do think we need to address why don't many of what earnest Christians are currently trying, why doesn't that seem to work? And I want to use the example to begin with of the typical, what would be called the classic quiet time. My morning devotions 
would be language in, in one tradition. I'm having my quiet time would be the, the language in another tradition. But kind of that, that idea of, no, 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 I, I do do this. And what, for most people, it usually involves something like Oswald Chambers, um, my utmost for his highest. I read a devotional. Or it's maybe a little bit more serious. It's Bible study. They've got a manual, a workbook. They're going through, you know, the book of Daniel. They're doing a study. So it's Bible study, even Bible memorization, right? And so they're like, wait a second, guys. I'm with you. I, this is my morning. I I start my day with, with this. I have my morning devotions. It doesn't seem to be doing what you guys are talking about. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm all too familiar with this to love. Yeah, me, me too. And friends, what we want to say is, again, that the nature of our humanity, our desperate need is union with God. Our desperate need is not information. It's not inspiration. Uh, our need it is the repair, the daily repair of the soul's union with God and the nourishment that his indwelling presence, his actual presence, provides within our humanity. And the problem is most of what people have tried or been showed, and again, mercy on all this, because no one came along and said, hey, walk with me for a year. Come live in my house. Come, let me show you how to do this. So what they're trying it isn't doing what they want it to do, and it's because it's it's not designed to heal, repair, union. That's the key. Yes. If we just start with the goal is in repairing union, the goal is the direct experience of God, yep. right? Because it's being with God that repairs union. I don't know if you've ever had a conflict with a dear friend, you know that eventually you have to get into the same room as them, look them in the eye, talk it through. It really does change things from like an email exchange. And yeah. this is kind of like that. The thing that I would, you know, add on that is if the goal is the direct experience of God, you know, one of the most important questions afterwards is how do you do that best? I mean, how are you, person listening, wired. There, this precise story comes up in, in Mulholland's book and as a spiritual director. He says, I had a young man come to me and he just said that he just felt like his spiritual life was dead. And I asked him, what do you do? And he goes, I get up early in the morning. I go to a quiet place. I read the Bible and pray. And Mulholland kind of scratches his chin and goes, okay, well, what are you like? You know, what, what personality tests? There's no science attached to personality theory, but what tests are you familiar with? Do you know the Myers-Briggs? Yeah, sure. You know, I'm an IST, I think Jay was this guy. And, and the point was, he goes, so you are a deeply sensate person, not an abstract person. And, you, and have you tried, instead of that, you know, going outside and taking a walk while you pray? Or do you know that you're allowed when you read the Bible to put on like background nature sounds or music yes. or something? Yes. And he says, he's like talking to this young man who's just staring at him going, I just kind of thought it was just like this yeah, and that it just didn't work. And there are some people that, the pattern that the you know the morning quiet time or the church wor worship service or whatever it is works for there are those people in both cases i'm not that person yeah i don't have a really easy time it's not easy for me to directly experience god in a church worship service i do go but not as like this is going to be just easy soul refreshment time yes. and i don't get into a quiet place like I turn on Rachmaninoff when I read the Bible. It yeah. really helps. If I need to hear God, I get out of the house. So you see what I'm saying? I, yeah, I am. So what we're, what we're suggesting, dear ones, is that the habits that you are beginning to adopt are habits 
that bring you into the nourishment of God, the experience of God, particularly as he fills your being. It's union. It's oneness. Okay, another delicate example is the high-octane worship. And I've just gotten to the place where I can't sit in those church services anymore because I am overstimulated. My soul is so detoxed from the world that I, I don't need stimulation. I don't like it. Like, don't amp me up. That's not helpful to me. It's too much stimulation. It's boom, 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 din, 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 you know. And and again, there's a time, there's a place, you know, there's I love rowdy worship, I love joyful worship. But as your daily, what your soul needs is to detox from the world through quiet, through beauty. And through, yeah, nature and, and practices that that heal your soul's union with God. So I I just want to encourage our friends who say, no, 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 I do have, I have good practices. They just don't seem to be doing what you guys are talking about. Say, so, yeah, because the goal, the goal is union, healing and repairing your union, because the world assaults it every day, the enemy assaults it every day, healing your union. What is going to do that for you? What are the what are the practices that will do that? And and to begin to adopt those. Again, we we are suggesting morning and evening because it's it tends to be part of the real estate of your day that you have the most say over. And you were mentioning something to me that was fascinating that the last thoughts. Yeah, I don't know if we talked about this before. It's a your, concept called neurogenesis. Yeah, and, I don't know. I don't remember. Last thought of the day, first thought well, of the day. What you go to sleep thinking about and what you wake up thinking about. So last thought, first thought has an enormous amount of sway in the bra- in the way that your brain ends up wiring the kind of place that you tell yourself the world is. Okay, so let, let's pause for a moment and talk about the power of habit. You, you know, the practices down through the ages— were meant to become life-giving habits, not soul-killing habits. They were they were meant to be restorative, renewing, grounding, get you out of the crazy, center you in God again. But they were meant to be habits. This is my normal now. It's just what I do. And and what's fascinating is as brain research has come online and they're discovering, oh wow, hey everybody, did you know that your habits actually shape the structure of your brain? And and you get into you get into a pattern. I was reading a fascinating article on how habits work. There's three stages, three parts to habit. Oh, all right. Yeah, it's called a habit loop. It's a three-part process. First, there's a cue or a trigger that tells your brain to go into auto mode as the behavior unfolds. And then there's the routine, which is the behavior itself, whatever it is you're doing. And then the third step, and this is so crucial, this is what you've been championing through this series, is the reward. It's something that your brain likes that helps it remember the habit loop in the future. So for example, a lot of folks now have been, have been through 30 days or, or somewhere in it on our pause app. Now, for me, all I have to do is hear those opening bars of the of the music before there's any narrative before there's any prayer it's just that music and that's my trigger and immediately my soul's like oh yay we're going into a lovely quiet place where i'm going to find god it's 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 just there's my trigger and then the pattern that my soul has learned is oh this is this is my solace moment i'm going to give everyone and everything to Jesus. I'm going to center myself in him. I'm going to experience him right now. Right. And the reward is peace. The reward is God. Yes. I like I get God again. And as the brain learns that, you don't have to persuade me to do that anymore. I can't wait to do that. I am excited to do that because the threefold loop has been established. I got my trigger right i've got my reward at the end and therefore the the pattern is not heavy 
it's my yoke is easy, right? It, it, it is a yoke. It is a habit. It is a routine, but it's a sacred healing routine. Yeah, it's so good. It's so helpful. It's so helpful for me, you know, to learn that it's important to start easy and that some of them will be easier than others, depending on who you are. But, it, you know, back to St. Benedict, the way will be narrow at first. None of these are going to be totally easy in the beginning, just because you haven't, it's not in your muscle memory. You haven't built the neural circuitry that you need. And it's new. New things are challenging. Hopefully they're fun. But they're not all going to be hard in the exact same way. And so as you begin replacing things, right? We talked about it before, and I find it everywhere. A recommended baseline practice, like on a few categories, in a healthy rule of life. One would be, if you can... A one mile, 20 minute walk a day. Yes. Not fast, you know, yes. not trying to go somewhere at a speed that just feels leisurely and a walk. For that, you, there are people I know who don't like that. I do. That one's easy. But Blaine, this is fascinating. So quite apart from, from sacred practices, I was actually reading on the lives of highly creative people. So there's a body of research done that, you know, they went out and looked at, yeah, what did Einstein do? What did Mozart do? What was those guys? How do they live? Right. Did you know that Kant. every single one of them had a daily walk? Right. It was a walk. And it, okay, so here's a precious story. I, I was helping a young man figure out what to do with his rhythms and cadences. And I, I recommend the walk. I use it. It's incredibly healing at least once a day. But my morning walk is, is like, that's a given. It's at dawn. It's as soon as there's enough light to go, I go. Anyway, he's like, you mean, you mean like my walk, my walk to my car? I'm like, no, no, no. He's like, oh, you mean exercise? I'm like, no. He had literally never taken a walk in his life. And wow. the, the idea was like foreign to him. But this is what the world has done to us. It's just kept us on such a fast pace, and it's to this, to that, to this, go, go, go. Be faster, be more efficient. And he's like, you want me to just go for a walk? I'm like, yeah, give it a try. And the fascinating thing is, I was chatting with a therapist about the power of EMDR and the healing of the disintegrated brain and some of the, you know, holding holding electrodes in your hands, right and left, right and left, as, as therapists will do, or tapping your knees, right yeah, and left, right. right. Well, walking. Walking. Left, right, left, right. The brain loves it. It's yes. like super healing. Yeah. And this again to say, it's possible over time to build a different kind of habit, Yeah, different kind of way. Dallas Willard says, you know, that the test of Christ-likeness is whether or not we spontaneously respond to our enemies in love. Yeah, I know. That one is a big ouch for me, dude. Yeah, that's a really rough test. Like, no judgment. It would be hard because I'm not there. But the invitation of rule of life is, you know, that even though it's hard in the beginning, when you get into the pattern it starts to feel easy, and it is like a pinwheel. You build up a certain momentum. And to give a couple of the other, you know, examples, uh, the ultra baselines and, you know, a walk is one. Some form of rest is one, like the weekly Sabbath. And if you haven't ever taken a dive into that, it's not primarily for rest. It's primarily for delight. There's a wonderful concept for you hedonists, I hope there's a lot of you out there, it's called pleasure stacking. And it is like that our week, the world is full of so many horrible things that on the Sabbath, we just act like Jesus is back and just stack it all in. My kids are learning to love Sabbath because, you know, it's play. It's, it's play. feasting. And it's, it's fun stuff. It's beautiful places. It's beautiful places. It's good, good things. And Ailish is like, after dinner, can we play make-believe again? And I'm like, yes, it's Sabbath. Of course we can. And you just go, whoa, 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 hang on. That, 
that is a part of this. Yeah. Feasting. Yeah. A connect time with a friend. Yeah. A, a, a time of rest during the day that doesn't have to be silence in your prayer closet staring at a white wall. Some, Unless you're someone who likes that. Like, you can, if you're me, you know, put on good headphones, turn on the hymn of the cherubim, and just let your soul just relax yes. into beautiful music, you know. The 30 Days to Resilient fits right in there with that just unwind time. Yes. In time, it works. Okay, gang. What I want to do this week is now take you into the experience. Because again, it, you know, the last days, the last years of Dallas Willard's life, he it was getting time with him. Can I come live with you? This is what people would request. It was the same with Eugene Peterson up in Montana. You could write him a letter. You could go spend some time with him. Because to be in the presence of someone who has a cadence they have a sacred rhythm. They have a rule of life that is immensely healing. Um, but we don't have that. Like, where do you? Most people don't have a place to go. So we're going to do it right here on this podcast. I want to take you all into what Stacy and I did this summer. So we would um, we would close our day out on the porch, and the crickets would be musical up in the yard and we would listen to it at least one but we would listen to one worship song and then we would play a 30 days evening session and then we would say our prayers now i want to take you into the actual experience of it because yeah it's worth a thousand words here so they're going to give you the crickets and we're going to take you into a song that's been a delightful song this summer. And then we're going to play a 30 days session. And then I'm going to lead you in prayer with some gracious spacing of all this.
Welcome to our first evening session in this module on communing with God in our inmost being. We are going to bring together a few of the practices we've learned for our evening sessions, allowing lengthier pauses and lingering with Jesus. Matthew 6, 6 When you pray, go into your inner room Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Over time, we can learn to grow very comfortable finding God within us, in the inner room of our soul, and communing with Him there. This is the epicenter of our intimacy with Jesus. As Thomas Akempis said, his visits with the inward man are frequent, his communion sweet and full of consolation, and his intimacy wonderful indeed. Song of Solomon 2, 14 Let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is pleasant, and your face is lovely. Jesus, we want to hear your voice. We want to see your face. Teach us, Lord, to linger with you where you dwell inside us. Your physical posture can help. Get your body into a position that enables you to turn your attention within. I like to sit in a favorite chair or lean against it on the floor, drawing my knees up to my chest, wrapping my arms around my knees, bowing my head. This helps me physically shut out the world around me and begin to descend with my attention 
into my inner life. Benevolent detachment is key. We use it to begin with, to release the day to Jesus, but you may find that you need to use it again as cares and concerns interrupt your lingering time with Jesus. That's very normal. Just practice it again and return to lingering with Jesus. So let's begin by releasing everyone and everything to Jesus. Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you, Lord. I give everyone and everything to you. We don't always know what it is we need to release in order to find Jesus within us, so ask him. What do I need to release, Lord? What is in the way? Settle in, releasing everything. We are turning our attention inward, shutting out the external world. We are giving the God who lives within us our attention. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is pleasant and your face is lovely. Practice loving Jesus as a way of giving him your attention. But remember, you are loving the Jesus who lives in your heart. Turn inward and love him. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you here within me. I love you, Lord. I love you here within me. Linger, loving Jesus in your own words. Begin to locate the presence of God within you. It might come at first simply as comfort or love or a sense that he is here. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is pleasant and your face is lovely. Remember, if your attention wanders, practice release. Ask the Holy Spirit to tune you in. Holy Spirit, help me tune into the presence of God within me. Help me become aware of Jesus right here within me. You may hear his voice. You may see his smile. You might simply sense him here with you, deep in your heart. Remove the pressure, just 
be with him. You might be helped by repeating his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is so much more to come, but that's good for now. And then the last thing we do is we pray. And I want to give you uh, something of the experience of that. So it would be, yes, Jesus, yes. We give everyone and everything to you now. Lord, I just, I lay it all down. The day, the people, my children, my work, the news, I I lay it all down, Lord. Everyone, everything in order to have you. And once again, I consecrate to you my body, soul, and spirit, my mind, my thoughts, my mental life, my heart, my emotions, my heart's life, my will. I consecrate to you my sleeping and my dreaming tonight all that is within me. And I bring the cleansing blood of Christ once more. Bring the cleansing blood of Christ through my body, soul, and spirit, my life and being, my mind, my mental life, my heart and my heart's life, my emotions, my sleeping, my dreaming tonight, all that is within me. I ask your Holy Spirit to restore our union, heal our union, Lord. I pray for your oneness. I pray for union, God. And tonight, now, we take our place in Christ, Ephesians 2, 6, that we have been raised with him to the place of authority. We bring our home, we bring our household. We bring all our kingdom and domain under your rule and into your kingdom tonight, all things of our domain. And from the place where we reign with Christ, we order your glory, your victory, the kingdom of God against all foul spirits that would attack us in the night, against the world and all of its corruptions against all black arts that has been raised against us, any form of cursing, any form of hatred, any form of ritual done against us. 
We bring your kingdom and your glory between us and the kingdoms of this world, beginning with this city right here. Jesus, we forgive all human sin against us and we cancel it by your blood. And we keep right now, we bring right now, your love, your kingdom, your glory between us and all people now, all people, Lord. No unhealthy ties. We cut off all forms of their sin and their warfare, anything they're projecting to us. We send it to you. We summon the angels to us again. The wonderful heavenly hosts, we ask them to help us cleanse our house tonight. Rebuild the hedges of protection here. Guard, protect, keep us in the night. We pray your Holy Spirit fills our dreams and our sleeping and that we wake, Lord, with you in the morning. And so, Jesus, once again, we release everything to you as we tuck into you tonight. We pray to be hidden deep in Christ now. In Jesus' name. And then, friends, we would just linger for a few moments to the crickets and by now it's really dark outside and and then we're able to go to bed in such a different state of being than we got home in after a day of work. It's good stuff, man. I feel great right now. <laughs> right? My body feels different. My soul feels different. I mean, I love this. This is like wag, 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 you know. I want this. I look forward to it so much. I'm embarrassed to say sometimes I'm eager for our guests to leave because <laughs> I just can't wait to get to my rhythm. I can't wait to get to the things that I do through the day that do this for me. 